Gareth, nice to see you on a big day. Um, a day when you've broken some hearts and, and you've made a number of players' dreams come true, I suspect. Um, but crucially, before we get into the individuals and, and the decisions that you've made, when you look at that squad of 26, do you believe it has everything in there needed to win a World Cup? <laughs> Yeah, that we, we've wanted to make sure we've got the balance of the squad right. Um, I think in this day and age, squad is more important than ever. We've, we're now five substitutes. You can have almost half the team changed during a game. So you want different options for different moments of, of matches um, and for different stages of the tournament as well. Um, we've obviously had to cover a couple of players that aren't yet fully fit, fully match fit as well. So having 26 available meant that we were probably able to take a couple of risks that you might not have been able to with 23. Um, but we think the balance is there and we've got cover in the, the positions we need. We're, we're lighter on depth in some positions than other in, in our country. Um, but we think we've got everything covered. We said widely across every bit of the media, I think, before you pick your squad, that James Madison would be the headline story, whether he was in or, or whether he was out. He's in. Why is he in? He's playing really well. Um, look, he's a good player. We've always said he's a good player. He's earned the right. Um, he, we think he can give us something slightly different to the other attacking players that we've got. So I think at various stages, there have been conversations, debates about James. There's been moments where, you know, ahead of the Euros, he, I don't think he was in contention. He had a bit of a problem with his hip. And then I think September was probably a, a fair debate. Um, but I think he's playing as well as any of the attacking players in this country. And, um, yeah, he is a little bit different to the others. We've got different types of threat, and I think we, we could need that. Uh, did you speak personally to Callum Wilson? Was he absolutely delighted? I haven't had a chance with Callum. I did speak to James because I think this morning there was a lot of speculation that James wouldn't be with us. And we decided a couple of weeks ago that we would, but we weren't obviously going to go <laughs> and tell him then. Um, I didn't get a chance to speak with Callum. My priority always on these days is the difficult conversations and the sad news, and that is really tough. You know, there's... Um, not many situations in football harder than that. Maybe releasing a young player um, at, at the early stages of their career, but the, the nature of those conversations, good and bad, reminds you of how much it means to a player to go to a World Cup. And um, yeah, I'm very conscious of that. Um, so it is a great day, but also for some, I've had to disappoint them. One of those is Tammy Abraham, I suspect, and you've gone for Wilson ahead of Tammy Abraham. What was that discussion and debate like in your mind? Yeah, look, um, Tammy's had a, a poor run of scoring form at the wrong time, really, and it's not a case where we're three, four weeks away from a finals and, and the start of the first match, we're now ten days, and so form could be more important. I, th I think we don't really know any of the players. We're watching... Um, their club form, but we don't really know where they are until we see them face to face, until we see them on the training pitch. We get regular medical updates from all their clubs, but there'll be medical issues that we're not completely aware of yet. Um, we know the form we're seeing in the matches, but even so, you, you still don't get the full picture from the players until you're able to speak with them, work with them, um, and see how they train with each other. You hinted that you wanted extra cover for, for players that might be struggling with injury, and obviously Calvin Phillips and Kyle Walker are the two obvious ones there. Mm. How are they? How big a gamble is it to include them in, in this squad? And, and can we assume that neither can really play a part in the, in the opening game? Uh, no, that's not the case. I mean, Calvin played last night. Um, uh, so I think with him, he's free of injury. The, um, we are aware that... Um, he's not going to be able to play 790 minutes, that, that, that won't be possible. Um, we're going to have to build his fitness level, um, but he's available, he's free of injury, and we don't really have, you know, we, we have Declan Rice as a defensive midfielder. Hendo can play there, but it's not his number one position. Um, so we don't have a lot of cover for that role in the country, and Calvin is a super player. 
and we feel that um, you know that's a, a risk worth taking because he's also generally his fitness is good um, and yeah, we, we think um, he can add to the group. And Kyle similarly? Kyle a little bit different in that he's not back in full training yet but he, he's going to be available before the end of the group stage and of course we had to make a very difficult call with Reese, who we think is a fantastic player but he wasn't going to be available until if everything went perfectly until the latter stages of the tournament and there were too many unknowns for us on that road to recovery and also I don't think we can take a player who's not available for the group that would be deemed arrogant in some circles but also we'd then be dropping if he if everything went well and he was available and he was ready and we were picking him then you'd be dropping him into a quarter final after eight weeks out and that's that would be really demanding so yeah, tough call. Um, Kyle is a long way ahead of that and um, is, is progressing really well. Thank you. Carrie? Hello, Gareth. Um, can we look at Harry Maguire, a player that's struggling to get minutes but has been a stalwart for you? What was your decision-making process and how much have you been in touch with Manchester United about what he's doing when he's not getting those playing minutes? And uh, will you be considering him as an out-and-out -out attacker after his uh, playing time alongside Ronaldo <coughs> against Real Sociedad? Well, physically, um, we've had really good communication with all of the clubs in this period on the training loads of all of the players because we've got to pick that up immediately on, uh, well, it'll be Wednesday before we see them on the training pitch. Um, so we needed to know those who are playing, what's their load, those who are playing less regularly. Some have had a unbelievably intense schedule, some have had less so. so we're picking up various fitness levels and we've got to get that right on the training pitch. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, we, we've picked um, our more experienced defenders and we think that at this moment in time, the younger ones have got some really good qualities, but um, we don't think they've quite done enough to push the more experienced ones out. And we think the tournament we're going into and the level of the matches, that, that needed to be the pecking order. You've always said that Trent Alexander-Arnold is an outstanding player, always in consideration, but he didn't start in the games building up to this announcement. What conversations did you have with him and what's been his reaction that he is now in the squad? No, as I said, really the only phone calls I've made have been to um, the two lads that are coming back from injury, the boys I left out of the squad and then to James because... Um, you know, I felt that was a, a, an important call to make this morning. The rest of the guys, you know, there's only so many hours in the day and we're, we've been monitoring fitness, monitoring matches, um, dealing with so much. So I think they'll be delighted, they'll get the news and, um, yeah, we've got plenty of time to chat over the next few weeks. And for you now, going forward, when you've got a real balance between the experience of the players, the 12 that have been to a World Cup, before and, and the rest of this squad and this, this quick turnaround. Is that exactly why you've brought the likes of Harry Maguire back in when they haven't had those match minutes? Yeah, he's one of our best centre-backs. So um, uh, I think we, we know um, within the squad, we've got a lot of players that we know have been to tournaments, have performed at the level, know what's required. Um, we've got other players who are playing well, who are in um, form right at this moment and we've got to balance all of that when we're picking our team. You didn't call up James Madison in the last camp, hasn't played for a few years now for England. Mm -hmm. A lot of people would have assumed that's because one of the camps he missed because he was ill and then was seen in a casino watching the match. You said at the time, well that would just remind him of the scrutiny of being an England player. Have you, mm -hmm. Did you have a conversation about that again or on his form? Is it just unnecessary? No, I, I, I didn't have... Look, that was unfortunate from his perspective in that um, it became a bigger issue than it was for me because of, uh, you know, you end up in the papers, nobody likes that. I, I live with it every day, so I don't, I don't take any notice of it. But um, for me, that wasn't the drama that it seemed to be for everybody else. Um, he's always been up against some really good players in that area of the pitch. And there's been moments where... We were playing 4-3-3, no number 10 type profile, and that didn't necessarily fit. Um, but he's, he's 
as I said earlier, he's playing exceptionally well. Um, we like the fact that he finds those pockets of space. He gets turned, he plays forward. Not enough players play forward in this day and age. Um, and of course, his set play delivery is outstanding. Um, and he can score goals from distance, which against low block defences is, is another attribute that is a little bit different to some of our other players. Thanks, Kerry. We'll go to John Murray from the BBC. Hiya, Gareth. You got me? Yeah. Can you give us a, a flavour of what James Madison's reaction was when he answered and you told him the news? Yeah, he was, he was delighted. And um, as I said, I had some very difficult calls that were emotionally at the other end of the spectrum. So, yeah, it was nice to give myself a little bit of a, uh, an enjoyable end to that because, you know, I'm excited about going to a World Cup. It's my fourth. And, um, you know, that's a, that's a privilege and an honour. And um, all of those calls, the, the difficult ones and the really enjoyable ones, were a reminder of what it means to the players. And what would you say this 26 that you've chosen this time has got that makes it stand out from the other two big squads you've picked for, for the World Cup and the Euros? Well, I think... I think they've all been good squads. I mean, in 2018, we were at the start of something where we hadn't won a knockout game for 10 years and um, there was a little bit less experience, perhaps, within the group of, of big matches. Um, I think this is similar in terms of its standing to the, to the group that went to the Euros. And, um, yeah, of course, within that period of time from the start to the end of that, some players have moved on age-wise, some players haven't progressed in the way they might have done. New players, young players have emerged that have, uh, that have given us great competition for places in most areas of the pitch. So um, we're excited by the group. We think there's a lot of um, exciting talent within it. Um, but the whole th group have got to come together. You know, there's a lot of challenges. It's a unique situation for everybody, this tournament, the timing of it. Um, and the obstacles just to get to this point medically as much as anything. So um, we've got to adapt better than everybody else in this, in this coming period. Thanks. Go to Jennifer. Hi, Gareth. Um, have the FA and the players come to a collective decision about what you will do or say if members from the LGBTQ plus community are victimised in any way during this particular World Cup? And as a follow-up question, Iran is your first match at this competition. They have been supplying the likes of Russia with weaponry. Should they be at this World Cup? So regarding the LGBT community, um, we stand for inclusivity and we're very, very strong on that. We think that's important in terms of all our supporters and we understand the challenges that, that, that this tournament brings within that. If it wasn't for the strength of that community, we wouldn't be women's European champions. So it's very, very important to us. Um, with Iran, um, look, that's a political situation that I don't know enough about to be able to comment. So those decisions have to be taken by governing bodies. And um, yeah, I can't comment with enough authority to give you a really considered view. FIFA have asked that nations don't talk about anything other than football when the football starts. Will you be going along with that? I think that's highly unlikely. Um, you know, I think we have always spoken um, about issues that we think should be talked about, particularly the ones we feel we can affect. Um, I think contrary to one or two um, observations in the last few weeks. We have spoken in the same way that other nations have spoken about this tournament and the human rights challenges. We've been very clear on our standpoint on that. Um, so, yeah, look, I think we would also like to focus primarily on the football. This is for every player and every coach and everybody traveling to a World Cup. This is a carnival of football. It's the thing you work for your whole life. So. You don't want that to be diminished by everything else that's going on around it currently. Um, but we recognise that, that we are going to be in that situation and we've got to accept and deal with it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, go to Oliver Kay. Hi, Gareth. Um, you spoke about um, being lighter in depth in some positions than in others. Um, is it fair to say that midfield is one of those and, and is it a disappointment 
that you're that you haven't had a lot of young midfielders or, or midfielders of any type emerging as real strong candidates for this squad? Well, to be fair, Jude has obviously emerged more in the last two years or 18 months since the Euros. I mean, we, we put him in at 17, 18. So, um, but look, everybody says we've got enormous depth, but we're 31% of the league last year. So I know I talked about that periodically three, four years ago. I think because the team have done well, that has masked that we've only got four English goalkeepers playing in the Premier League currently. Um, left backs, there aren't many playing. Um, we've got an unbelievable uh, injury list of full backs at the moment, left and right, um, quite incredible. And yeah, sort of number six, if you like, um, defensive pivot midfield player um, is, is also light in terms of actually developing that position in our country. So, you know, Declan is really a converted defender. Um, and Calvin is sort of slightly converted as well. So, um, yeah, we, we haven't uh, <coughs> produced that type of player for a long time, and it's something that, you know, our academies, uh, you know, I think could focus on, but that's, you know, that's for the longer term. That's, we, we've got the players we've got. We're happy with the squad we've got. We always have to find a way of playing to the best attributes of the players we've got, and we're, we, we can be exciting and dangerous um, even though we don't have those types of profile of players. And um, Antonio Conte was saying last night that Harry Kane is tired, exhausted. Um, I'm sure is, he is, yeah. Is, is, that, is that a concern um, for you, not, well, particularly with Harry, but, but with, with all the players, that, that <coughs> a lot of them do look tired or, or are carrying injuries? Yeah, look, uh, again, I think I've stood here several times in the last year and said this this World Cup, everybody said this World Cup being in the middle of the season would be better for us. And I said we would lose players. Sadly, that has been the case. The schedule is what it is. Um, but we've got to refresh the players. We've got to excite them when they get through the door. We've got a, a period of time where we won't set foot on the training pitch when they arrive because we'll travel on Tuesday. So we have got some that need to train. Um, and we've got some that will benefit from a few days of, of doing nothing but get excited about playing for England, frankly. So we, we can only manage that when the players are with us. Um, we understand the challenges for the clubs now and after the tournament, and um, we, we've just got to make sure we focus on the bits we can control. Thank you. Take one there. Um, what have you learned from the Euros that you can take into the World Cup? And why did you decide not to select uh, James Ward-Prowse? Yeah, with, um, with James, um, he's really competing profile-wise with Bellingham and Henderson, maybe to a lesser degree Gallagher. Um, I, I don't see him in the same profile as Rice or Phillips. They're different types of players. Um, it, it, he, he's just behind those guys frankly, and uh, it's as simple as that. Now, we've still got another round of games to get through, so I've spoken with a few of the players to say that things can still change over the weekend. Um, from the Euros, there's loads of things we've learned, loads of things we did right, loads of things that um, actually won't apply in this tournament because it's a different time of the year, it's more condensed, we don't have warm-up games, we're going to be playing in different conditions heat-wise. So you're always learning from every tournament, but also there are unique things around every tournament as well. And um, we've got to make sure that we um, weave all of that together. And have you spoken to Ben White? There's inclusion. No, uh, the only people I've spoken to are the ones I've already uh, uh, mentioned, but I, I would imagine, I hope he's very excited about being involved. Thank you. We've got to James Orley from ESPN. Hi, Gareth. Um, just following on from what you just said there, um, could you give us a bit more detail about the standby? Is there a sort of a formal standby list? No, we, we had to name basically every English player that was available on a long list. Um, and um, there are some conversations I've had with players in the last couple of days where clearly they're going to be the next ones in in their positions. Um, but then we just don't know what might happen in, in, in the next few days. Um, 
you know, I, I, I think there are two left backs that got injured last night, for example. So um, we've got to be fluid, adaptable, and, and ready for anything, really. Just on that, how stressful is this weekend going to be for you with these games? Not for me. <laughs> um, there's nothing I can do about it. So, you know, the, uh, watching the, the, the uh, matches unfold, you're always intrigued to see how the uh, tactical games are going, the performances, the results, the form of the players, of course. Um, but we can do nothing about the injuries that's out of our hands. We've already been hit in that way. It could happen again. But we've got to adapt. We've got good players to come in, and it'll be opportunities for others if uh, if we lost people. Thanks, James. We'll take one here. Just on the side here. Yeah. Hi, Gareth. Um, considering where the World Cup is this year, and some of the issues that have been documented in Qatar, will England be taking the knee on a worldwide stage? Um, you know, to support and get behind some of the black and mixed race players. Yeah, that would be a, a discussion we have with the players when we get into camp. Um, and I'm always um, supportive of what they want to do. I have a view, but I, I don't want to influence them too much um, because I think it's important that they have a voice and they have a say in that. OK, thank you. I can't see any more hands. So, Oh, sorry, we've got uh, Jack Pitbrook from Athletic. Hi, Gareth. Um, you, you, you've talked in the past about seeing Madison as a number 10 and the implications that that had for the formation that you might play. Can we read anything into his selection into the formations you might use in Qatar? Well, he, he um, is obviously playing from the right for Leicester. Uh, his best work is in that 10 slot. That's where he ends up. So how, how he ends up there is, is different. I think, um, I think we've got to be flexible on our systems because um, everybody's always pushing, do you know your, your best team sort of eight months from a tournament? And I've always said we've got to be fluid because you just don't know who you'll have. Um, we can't recruit like you would at a club to a set system. Um, and even, you know, there, there are only a, probably a couple of teams in the league that have been able to stick with a preferred system of play and exact style of play this season at the top end. Um, even some of the biggest teams have had to change because injuries have provoked them into changes of system. So we've always had that flexibility. We think it's important. We've got to look at who our best players will be um, and also you know, where, are the, where are the flaws in the opponent to be able to exploit them. Thank you. Rob, do you want to come back in the last one? Gareth, can I just ask you one final one about, about Conor Gallagher, um, who was a little bit of a surprise to us, but, that, but that's because we know James Ward-Prowse is, is so well-known to you and, and so well-established. Um, what does Conor offer? How do you expect to use him? Because he's a little bit more forward-thinking than the defensive midfielders you've perhaps talked about. Yeah, but, but also he's fantastic at pressing the ball. And, um, you know, I think there are going to be moments in these games where we need certain attributes and... There are any number of players in this squad with different attributes to be able to utilise at those moments. And we feel he could be um, that sort of a player. So he's not as experienced with us as some of the others, but he has an impact in games. He's got a goal threat. Um, he, he's, you know, when you talk about midfield players, you look at, do they stop goals? Do they create goals? Do they score goals? He does a little bit of all of that, actually. So um, we were really pleased with the way he responded to being um, left out of our squad, went with the under-21s, um, performed really well. His mentality was excellent. And it's a, a great example that if you approach it in that way, there's, there's always a route back with us. And, um, and he's managed to achieve that straight away. Thank you. We'll go to Matt Reid. Hi, Gareth. Um, so a number of our players are, are, are short of their top form at the moment and short of their top form with England from recent performances or fitness. So uh, how, do, how, how, how are we going to transfer, trans, transform that over the coming weeks before the first game? And how key will the group stages will be in, in, in building that confidence and building that form, essentially? Yeah, I mean, look, um, form can be temporary, but, you know, that, that's um, a very individual thing. And um, the key is the work on the training pitch. We don't have a long time to do that. So we've got to see very quickly how people present 
you know, we've got a pretty good idea of where people stand at the moment, but there's also, there's opportunity here because um, there, are, there are players who are in good form who could push their way into the starting 11. And um, we're, we're not steadfast on, on an 11. I think there are some players that we're pretty certain next week will be in that starting team, but there are a number of positions that we want to have a look at and to see um, exactly how people present. Um, Part of that is this schedule that they're coming in off as well, because you know some have played every three days for the last five six weeks, um, and we we just don't know what the impact of that's going to be. Thank you, and we'll finish with one from Gabriel. From okay. Thanks very much, Greg. G Gareth, twenty one of the twenty six named were in the original Euro squad. Well, what does that tell you about the foundation you've got, uh, and is the best yet to come from a group you know so well? Yeah, I think that um, we, you know, this, if you get to the final of a competition 18 months ago, there should be a fair amount of stability in terms of what that group were capable of on the biggest stage, um, but also room for people who are playing well to come into the group. And we've always tried to work that way. I think you've got to, I know people talk about being overly loyal, but you've got to have some consistency in your thinking because it's hard to build something without having that consistency. And then others can, can, can come in and thrive. So without doubt, there are a number of players who will be better for the experiences they've already had. Um, the key now is that we have to show that on the biggest stage. It also says that it's been hard to break into this squad. Well, no, I would argue that, you know, across 18 months, five, is, is quite a big turnaround because um, there's, a, there's only Connor in terms of young ones who's, who's come in, I think, um, into that. I'm trying to, trying to think back 18 months. Um, we've looked at one or two others. There was a period where Emil Smith-Rowe had a go and was playing really well. He's <coughs> sadly lost him. Obviously, we've lost Reese, but Reese was with us in the Euros, so, and, and Ben. Um, but yeah, look, I, I think most international te or most teams across a period of 18 months wouldn't change much, much more than four or five players. Okay, thank you. We'll leave it there. Thank you, Gareth. Thank you, everybody. Okay. And we'll see you in Qatar. Thank you.